chapter 1 of the book of Bamidbar, verse 50. We're being told that after we counted, after Moshe was told to count the regular B'nai Israel, he was told to count the Levites. We got the Levites. Here we have a Levite and Mordechai. And now we have, it says, V'atav kedes aleviyim. Now you can count the Levites. Amishkano Idus, the, ta- the tabernacle of the testimony. V'alkol kelev, over all the utensils. V'alkol asherlo, everything that is in it. So they're the ones who are responsible to carry the Mishkan, all its utensils. They're the ones who are responsible to minister it. And around the Mishkan, they shall camp. Being to say the Levites are being appointed now. The word Havkeid here means to be appointed. Rashi here says it means, Havkeid means appoint. Because earlier we had said Pekod meaning to count. So it's a little bit confusing. So here means Lashon Minoy Surara Al Davar Shehumunawab Kamova Yafkeid Hamel Pikidim in the book of Esther. So there's another verse called Layafkeid Pikidim in uh in the end of the book of Baratius in Vayigash. Where, jo- where Pharaoh appointed overseers. The FK picky dim. Joseph gave Pharaoh instructions to appoint overseers. So here we're seeing uh, that the word means appoint and not to count. So the Levite shall be appointed over the Mishkan, all utensils, to carry the Mishkan, all utensils, and to minister to it and to camp around the Mishkan. Ubin Soa ha Mishkan, verse 51. And when the Mishkan traveled, you'll read Soa with him. Hold on, we have a question here from Mr. Shechman, Jerry. Yes, Jerry, what's your question? You have to... Yes, here we are. Um, since there is a Hebrew word for appointing, uh, why does the Torah use Hafkein, which confuses the reader? I don't know the answer to that. Why? Like, why did the Torah pick a? I don't know. It's a good question. It's a good question. I don't know. Okay, so um, we'll go. We'll go on. I, I don't know. I don't. You never know why the Torah uses one word. Sometimes there is the only idea I could share is sometimes the Torah. There's something called a light vort. You know what a light vort is. It says sometimes the Torah, when the Torah is discussed in a paragraph in the Torah or in a theme, the Torah uses a word and then keeps using that same word uh, thematically, meaning to say the Torah is like a musician, that the musician, they'll do a piece, they'll repeat each piece like three times, and then the fourth time it'll like... How do you ver- spell? What? How do you say light? How do you spell it? L-E-I-T and then uh, wart, uh, W-O-R-T, you know, like whatever, something like that. It's German. Because it's lay motif. Right, motif. That's the music, music, yeah. probably lay. Yeah, so the yeah. point is that, you know, it's like variation in, in music. You vary a variation of, that's what, that's how you see the genius of the piece. So the Torah maybe uses the same word over and over again in a, in a paragraph to make a point about that this paragraph is about that word. That's for just strictly speaking from a literary analysis. That's what the literary uh, cr- uh, critics might might notice, but the uh, rabbinic ideas. I'm sure there are many, but I'm not familiar with any off the top of my head. So the uh, the next verse states, "Uvinso uh, Mishkan," and when the Mishkan traveled, when the Mishkan traveled. You'll redo, O so LVM. The Levites shall take it down. Uvachanot Mishkan. When the Mishkan camped, Yakimo so LVM. The Levites will erect it, will build it. Vazara Karev Yumat. Then an alien who approaches shall be put to death. You're not allowed to do the service of the Levites. Rashi says, What does it mean, Yo redo Oto? Yifarkun, the Levite's responsibility is to re, is to dismantle it. And when they come to journey, 
they uh, they would dismantle it and then from its standing position and then they would carry it until the place where the cloud would rest and then they would camp and set it up again. Vazara Karov and the alien who approached it, i.e. the non um the non-Levite, Rashi says, it doesn't mean the one who comes close to the Mishkan will die. It means la vodatamzo, that if there's a non-Levite who tries to do the task of the Levites, he's going to be put to death. The Levite's job was to take the Mishkan down. If somebody who was not a Levite tried to do that, then he'd be put to death. You can't, yeah, everybody's got a role. You can't deviate. You must, Rashi says, bidei shemayim. You don't put him to death by the court. Heaven will put him to death. Death by the hand of heaven. Okay. Okay, next verse. And the children of Israel shall camp, each one according to their flag, each one according to their camp by their armies. Rashi says, There were flags arranged in this book, in the next chapter. Every three tribes had their own flag. So basically, there were three tribes together. But it doesn't mean that they had a flag here. Rashi, here too we have, uh, <laughs> it's a little bit confusing for me. I, I misread it. Degel can mean a flag, and every tribe had their own flag. But Rashi says that's not what it means here. Here, it doesn't mean each a flag. Rashi sees it as each division. Shlosha Shvatim will call because there were four encampments around the Mishkan, one, two, three, four, and each encampment had three tribes, which made up a division. So Rashi says three tribes for each flag. Degel doesn't mean three tribes for each flag. It means three tribes for each division. That's what Rashi said. Now this is a little confusing. That Rashi does not translate Degel as a flag. It's an interesting thing. What? Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. But Rashi does not translate it that way. He he translates it as uh, as a division, unusual. The English it just says banner. Well, that's so, a flag. Right. But Rashi is not adopting that approach. Rashi is saying each man according to his division. You see this also, if you don't, uh, chapter 2, verse 2 of the same uh, book, if you just go up ahead to chapter 2, verse 2, there it states, mm-hmm. Rashi says, mm-hmm. Every division will have a sign. Every division will have a sign, a colored sheet of cloth hanging from it. So the flag here, Rashi calls a sign. This flag is not like that one. And as a result of it, everyone will recognize this division. Rashi says that Degel does not mean flag. It means a division, uh, like a like a formation. You know, it's modern Hebrew, Degel is certainly a flag. In modern Hebrew. Is there, I mean, I don't, I don't know what, what the right terminology is, but it feels a little bit like it's semantics. Like I'm looking at all the different English terms. I'm talking about a, a, a colored cloth. Where are you banner. looking? Where are I'm you looking, looking under verse the, the Rashi and Sparia for chapter two, uh, verse two, two. Two, verse two. So when they, when they talk about, they, you, you see certain like, you have symbol, you have insignia, you have banner. You have no, flag. well, Rosh, he says, yeah, but he's saying that the, the Degel should have a, fla- a flag. But each deg, but the Degel is not the flag. The division should have a flag, but the Degel does not mean flag. That's what he's saying here. Um, As he's saying, each division shall have for itself a sign, a colored sheet of cloth hanging in its midst. 
And the color of the sign division is unlike the color of that of the sign of that division. The color of each one is like the color of a stone. And that way everyone will recognize his division. Right, so they have to find their encampment. So it's not, there's not, according to this approach, I know it's so ingrained in us that every flag, every tribe had their own flag, but Rashi's saying that's not the case. I mean, they might have, but Rashi's not saying that. Rashi's saying that, that each division should have a sign. Rabbi, Jerry has his hand up, but I... Yeah. I think when I was in the army, this we had a flag for each one of the of the parts of the army, and then there's yeah. one for the whole division, and then there's one for each uh, battalion. So that's, maybe that's fine. What that's what meant. no, it's not what he means. Rashi does not say that the word degel means flag. That's the point that he's making. That's what. That's what's. I mean, it's possible that each tribe had their own flag, but Rashi doesn't say that. Rashi is talking about the division. And and the way this is clear is from the footnote here in this uh, commentary. And I'll read the footnote out loud. Unlike other commentaries who understand Degawa's flag, Rashi sees it as division, disposition of forces, military formation. This is indicated by his comments to two, chapter 2, verse 2 below. And also see Rashi to Isaiah, chapter 5, verse 26, Nase Lagoyim, where he describes a flag in detail, he never once uses the word degel. See also his comments to Psalms 26 and Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 4, and chapter 5, verse 10. And if you look at his, at his thing in chapter 2, verse 2, Rashi makes his comment only with regard to Osos, but not with regard to Digo, because he understands Digo as division, formation, and not as flag. So that's what pretty clear. Rashi does not understand Dego as a flag, which is a shocking approach to me, because I assume that everybody assumes Dego as a flag. Very interesting. Yes, Jerry. Uh, I mean, yes. to me, it's interesting. It might not be interesting to others. Yes, Jerry. I, I've forgotten the name of the rabbi that we... Uh, who rabbi Steinfeld? Uh, uh, he died of Crohn's disease uh, recently. Rabbi Steinsaltz? Yes, Steinsaltz. What is he? What is Steinsaltz? Does Rabbi Steinsaltz comment on this? How does Rabbi Steinsaltz translate in chapter 2, verse 52? How does he translate? I'm looking at the discussion at the bottom. It says, each had his banner. This is possibly the first literary mention of the idea that a banner represents membership in a specific group. So, so he, he, he does not accept Rashi. Here, let me see this for a second. Let's see what he says here. Chapter 2, verse 52. He says, I mean, chapter 1, verse 52, he says, let's see, he says, verse, the children of Israel shall encamp, each man is camp, each man at his banner. So he translates it as banner, but he has a footnote for that, footnote D. This is possibly the first letter, no, let's see, but we have to go to the back. To see his footnotes, we go to the book of Bamidbar in the back. Here, notes to Exodus. For what it's worth, Ramadan, there's a little bit about the flags, and then there's a great deal more about each division who's in it and why they are where they are in terms of northwest, east, and south. But he does. Definitely bring up the flag story. Just one second. Where is he? He has a letter here. Where does he put these letters? Can you see it has a little letter over the word banner? What that's a D? What's that a reference to? I'm not even sure. Where is the letter going to? He has a letter there. You probably have to look at the introduction to that volume where he uh, describes um, all of his uh, footnotes and how they're designated. Yeah, let me see what he does with the D. Um, okay. 
No, he doesn't. I don't see what this D is referring to. Yeah. Uh, um, Rather than waste time, you uh, in your spare time, Rabbi, tomorrow, uh, by tomorrow or the next day, uh, yeah. find, find that footnote B. No, it's a D. It's it's uh, it's, it's just now it's got in my head. G. You're looking for yeah, yeah. D is on the same page. It's because oh, in Stein's cell, it's because D at, at his banner, his flags are with the D. And if you look down, there's each of his banner. Oh, so that's what he's referring to? What? It's, it's on the same thing in the light and grayed out yeah. special. Okay, yeah. So he says, yeah, so basically he's not, yeah, he's. He doesn't give a source, but he adopts what everybody else says, other than Rashi. Everybody, Rashi's the uh, Rashi's the outlier here, as far as I know, because everybody else assumes that, uh, that I've ever seen, but maybe it's incorrect. Assumes that Dago means a flag or a banner, but Rashi does not take that approach. Okay, well, go on. About yeah, Selene. Yeah, who's Payrush? Um, yeah, but they they do appear, they do appear. The offspring, the offspring of Moshe appear in the Talmud. Um, so, right, they just they weren't designated as Kohanim, but presumably that they were that when they came, they never left. We know that Yisro perhaps left, but it never says that Moshe's sons left. Yisro was the one who was looking to leaving, but it says they came, and it never says they left. No, that they came and it never says they left. So assume, the assumption is they stayed. Yeah. But it never says they left. No, it never says that sons left. It never says Sipora possibly he might have sent her away, depending how you read that passage. It says that Moshe sent away his uh they spoke about Aodota Isha. They spoke about the woman after he sent her away. Perhaps that's a reference to Sipora. Yisro perhaps left. But it never says that the two boys left. So the assumption is that they were there. Okay, so, um, so the uh, verse states, the Leviim Yachanu Savivu Mishkan Aidu to Levite shall camp around the Mishkan, Veloya Ketzef Al Adat B'nei Yisrael, so that they're not become a plague or a wrath on. The congregation, and then the Levites will um, will safeguard the watch of the Mishkan of the Edut. So, Rashi says, "Imta su kemitzvati." If you act according to my commandment, loyaketzef. Then there will not be a wrath. The imlav, but if you don't, she kantu zarim bavodotam zo. If you act according to my commandments, so that there shall be no wrath. But if not, if you act according to my laws, there won't be any wrath. But if you don't act, she kantu zarim bavodotam zo. If now Levites start to do this task, yeah, there'll be a wrath, like we find in the incident of Korach. So mean to say, if you try to start giving out my jobs to other people who I don't tell you to do it, there's going to be big problems. A lot of people who are, um, a lot of people have issues with the concept, I mean, liberal Judaism has issues with the concept of kahuna and, and levium, and how could there be certain people who are born genetically to have 
a specific task. So people don't like it. It's not comfortable. It goes against meritocracy. Korach was one of the first who said, how can you have, you get all the power. I should have the power. <laughs> That's what they're really saying. But anyway, here we're being told specifically, if you try to deviate from the from the, what Hashem says, without the Levites or be in charge of caring, then there'll be a ketzef, there'll be a wrath. Is it really about the, the fact that they're born Levites that somehow there's something that's intrinsic to who they are? Or is it just because that's what God said? God said, don't, the Levites are the ones who have this duty, nobody else who comes in. In other words, there's a slight, there's a nuance, right? I don't think the Levites are any better, but I but they have a specific task, and that task makes them different and they have a responsibility and the kohanim have a they have a specific task they have to they have certain especially the kohanim they have certain aspects to their life where they have to guard purity more than a regular israelite they can't come in contact with the dead and when they channel their blessings to the children of israel god is channeled through them to give us the blessings and they're involved in holier tasks and only the only a, the high priest on Yom Kippur can only come from the coin. Now we see in the Talmud that the Talmud has a story about Shmaya uh, and Avtalion, who were descendants from converts. And one time the Kohen Gadol was leaving the temple on Yom Kippur, and uh, and. Everybody was following the high priest. And then they saw Shemaya and Aftalion, and they were the leader and rabbis of the generation. And everybody left the Kohen Gadol and started walking after Shemaya and Aftalion. And so the Kohen Gadol criticized them. He says, you're following after the children of converts. He criticized them. And then Shemaya and Aftalion said, yeah, it's better for them to, follow, to leave the descendants of Aaron who doesn't follow in the ways of Aaron and follow the descendants of the converts who are the true followers of Aaron. So the Talmud is clearly, basically, the story of the Talmud reflects the rabbis saying that there is a meritocracy, that, that it's all about who is really the true descendant. But at the same time, you cannot take away from the fact that there are certain tasks that only the Kohen Gadol can do, only the Kohanim can do. So even though there is that story, even though Shemai and Aftalim were clearly greater than the Kohen Gadol, they were not allowed to perform the task in the temple. Only the Kohen Gadol was on Yom Kippur. So there is this tension between those who um, those who there's this tension between those who are great on their own and those who are the true descendants. And you know, we have to uh, be aware of that. And it's not only attention with the Kohanim and with the uh, with the Israelites. It's just attention in general. You know, if you're and, and if you're born Jewish, you have certain rights that if you're not Jew, that if you're not born Jewish, you don't. And that's, by the way, another perfect example of that is the country we live in, the United States of America. If you're born as a naturalized born American citizen, right? Was it? If you're born in America. You have the right to run for president, but if you're not, you don't have that right. But America is a meritocracy. So we say, okay, this is a limited area. I'm sure if I thought about it, there'd be other examples. But the point is, if it's a limited area, but it, it speaks to the most essential power, then it speaks to a core value. And there's something like, there's this balance between meritocracy and also retaining the ancestral link and so that's kind of like what's going on a little bit um it's a little bit awkward to speak about because people like to say that there's always this or always that but the truth is the whole tradition is probably just more nuanced than than uh, people would uh want to assume okay so now um let's just do the uh, last verse and then we'll stop to have a mincha and so then the children of Israel did 
the children of Israel did like everything that Hashem commanded Moshe, thus they did. So now we'll start the next pasuk. God spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, Ish al Obey Savosam, chapter 2, verse 2. Each man, again, Rashi says, not by his flag, but each man by his division. By the signs of their father's house. Israel, the children of Israel shall camp. Um, at a distance around the Oam Oed, they shall camp. Okay, we'll pick up this Rashi tomorrow, chapter chapter. Two verse two, we'll do the Rashi and we'll take it up tomorrow. But for now, we'll stop here. Um, I want to say that 